Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for UTIT's weekly seminar. Uh, I'm Mahi. I'm the vice president of the club. Uh, today, uh, Patricia will be presenting uh, an overview of uh, knowledge synthesis method. Uh, Patricia Ayala is a research services librarian with the University of Toronto, um, specifically at the Gerstein Science uh, Information Center. Uh, with that, Patricia, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I wish I could see everyone's faces, um, but I can't, which is fine. Uh, thank you for the invitation. So uh, I'm just going to get jump right in because um, I want to have enough time for questions at the end. And I'm going to say, kick start this. If there's any questions at any point, uh, if you can kindly put them in the chat. And if someone, if you don't feel comfortable unmuting yourself, and kindly, if someone can read them out loud to me, but as I mentioned before, there will be time for questions at the end. So you want to know about uh, knowledge synthesis. So I'm here to tell you that they can make you smile, cry, rage, uh, get a little bit scared or all of the above. And that's okay. Uh, when I first was learning about these things, I went through all of those emotions myself, and I still do sometimes. Um, so knowledge synthesis in a nutshell, uh, you know, the idea behind a knowledge synthesis is that you, you take a very rigorous methodological based approach and very rigorous in methods to take a large volume of information out of the evidence out there, the literature, and you synthesize it and built into the methods are ways so that whatever you synthesize, you summarize, your findings are unbiased, okay, and transparent. Um, knowledge synthesis really is an umbrella term for a lot of different study types within that realm and they include systematic reviews, scoping reviews, rapid reviews, realist reviews. And, and the, the methods keep growing and changing. So this is a typical knowledge synthesis cycle and applies to the majority of uh, these study types. You start with your topic selection. So you figure out, hmm, this is my research question. I wanna find out X, you know? You conceptualize and create a protocol. Your protocol is essentially your plan. And I will talk about these things a little bit more in depth individually in all the steps of the process. You search for studies. So you, again, uh, these things involve a variety of skill sets and they're a team sport. You cannot complete one of these things individually, primarily because it's unsustainable. It's a lot of work, but also because built into the methods is the you want to be as unbiased as possible. And basically completing one of these things on your own is an opinion piece, as opposed to a more rigorous approach to, you know, the question, an answer to the question that you want to find. So you search for studies, uh, you create a comprehensive search strategy uh, that, and all of these things, the, the goal is that they are reproducible and transparent. You screen for studies, and I'll talk about what that means exactly. You appraise them, you abstract the data, uh, pertinent to your research question, and then you synthesize and interpret the results. This is primarily the cycle where all of knowledge synthesis follow. There are a couple of differences for, depending on the type of, you know, the method and the type of uh, KS knowledge synthesis that you want to complete, and I'll go over that as well. So there are different types of knowledge synthesis, like I mentioned before, there are a lot of them, okay? Systematic reviews and scoping reviews seems to be like the most, uh, the usual suspects that people know about or at least have heard that term. Uh, Meta-analysis, rapid reviews, realist reviews. And like I mentioned before, it's also a challenge because these methods keep evolving, which is great to sort of keep up with a lot of the more new and challenges that are coming up, right? So the handbooks and methods are being updated, but it also means that you have to keep on top of everything else and new different types of knowledge and this is seem to be all, always be popping up. So, I just want to give you sort of a uh, one of the things that are to me it's critical for you to take away, um, and this is nicely uh, articulated or illustrated in a table, and these are hyperlinked in, in any, all of my slides. So these things again, the most common uh, steps in the process um, that they involve is typically pr a protocol that's non-negotiable, which is the plan for your study the comprehensive searching and the two levels of screening, right? And here you can start to see where some of these steps may vary depending on a knowledge synthesis type that you're completing, okay? So for example, in rapid reviews, uh, and by the way, there's a reason for that, right? So uh, 
in rapid reviews, they are meant to drive policy in states of emergency. So for example, um, it, it also requires a protocol. It may or may not include comprehensive searches and it may or may not implement two levels of screening. Now, most people like this shouldn't be an attraction point for you to say, hmm, I don't really wanna spend the time or I don't have the time or the resources. So I'm just gonna aim for, I'm gonna pick rapid reviews as my methodology to answer this question. In reality, the folks that do rapid reviews or that should be doing rapid reviews are actually the experts, like even people who have been doing this other type of knowledge synthesis for way longer. And I'm very, very um, experienced in the methodology because they very carefully decide what concessions they're gonna take. And rapid reviews should only be done in cases where you know, you need to make a decision in policy because of an emergent issue. A perfect example is COVID, right? Like there wasn't enough information out there uh, to synthesize, you know, or the study types, uh, the, the types of studies that would, be, would get included. Um, you know, there wasn't enough time, uh, but you needed some kind of, to make informed decisions, the best for whatever was available quickly. So say, in August of 2020, and COVID had been around and like even researched about COVID, it was, you know, slim pickings, but you needed that. And so the rapid review was the best methodology for that topic. If you told me that this is a well-founded topic um, and you're reaching for a rapid review, that's not the best method that you really should be searching for or choosing in order to complete your study. Because the question you always have to keep in mind is, what is the best method? What is the best study type that I need in order to answer my question to the best possible way. Because at the end of the day, what we're all trying to do here in, in the research ecosphere and scholarship is to contribute to scholarship into, in a meaningful way, right? So that's something that you should always keep in mind. So every review type uh, has a different method, okay? If you're completing systematic reviews, you should follow the Cochrane Handbook, CRD York, or JBI. If you're doing scoping reviews, ArcCN O'Malley, JBI, Levac and Clonhoon. If you're doing rapid reviews, uh, the World Health Organization, and so forth and so on. Okay, um, so methods is one thing. And the most important thing to remember, reporting guideline is another. The most important thing, because they also have a reporting guideline. So there's, it's, very, it's quite beautiful, actually. There's an instruction on how to do these things. Those are your methods. How are you going to do them? And then the reporting guideline means how you're going to present them. You know, how are you going to write them up? Um, regardless of the method, regardless, you just need to adhere to it. Okay. The most common variants are critical appraisal and the type of synthesis. The synthesis really is just the type of story you're going to tell. And depending on your question, you know, maybe a quantitative uh, analysis is actually the best suited for your question. Okay. To answer that, if maybe a qualitative, maybe mixed methods, right. And that again is driven by your research question. And what, again, to keep in mind, what is the best approach in order for me to answer this question to the best of my ability, okay? So why do knowledge synthesis require a team? Well, the aim is to find, select, appraise, uh, and synthesize uh, any topic in an unbiased way. Built into the methods are tasks that cannot be performed by a single reviewer. So for example, screening for studies means exactly that. You screen for studies in two different stages and both of them involve independent reviewer pairs. So imagine we put together this beautiful comprehensive protocol, we've searched the literature and now we're ready to screen. And so individual reviewer pairs, so let's say Osman and I are reviewing, uh, are ready to screen our studies. So I need to look or whoever else is in the team, we use screen for studies individually. So I look at the title and abstract and depending on the eligibility criteria, so the criteria that I have already decided in the protocol, um, you make a decision on whether that study will be included or excluded, okay? And the other person not talking to each other, we have to vote. Whenever there's a discrepancy, you need a third reviewer needs to break that tie. So say I said yes, someone else said no in our team someone else has to come and decide whether that study moves forward to the second stage or not. And again, the goal of all of these things is to be as unbiased as possible, okay? So what is a protocol? Honestly, protocols are a beautiful thing. 
they're a thing of beauty, okay? It's basically your detailed predefined plan that you need to adhere to in order to conduct your study in a transparent and reproducible way. It should outline uh, everything in the process and how things will be managed in the review. So very clearly articulate your research question, the background, set it in the, what is your research question? Why is it important? Why are you doing it? Setting in the context of what's already known. So what is the gap in evidence or the literature that you're trying to address? Okay, so the first thing actually that before you even start to do a knowledge synthesis that you should take a look and see if there is a review already published out there on this topic, because if there is, then you shouldn't be doing, it's a lot of work. You shouldn't be doing a review on that topic, right? So let's pretend, okay, there's not a review on this. We're moving forward with a protocol. And now we put together, okay, what kind of studies are we going to take in and out? What population or problem or issue? What are those things? Define them. Define the scope of it too, right? And very clearly articulate it. How will studies be selected? How will the data be abstracted? How will they be assessed? You know, um, And I put a hyperlink on that too uh, for you to take a look at everything else uh, that you need to consider when you're building your protocol. A lot of folks resist writing a protocol, but honestly, think about it this way. When the more uh, love you put into building your protocol, actually you're already helping your future self write the manuscript because the only different thing between your protocol and your final manuscript is the things that you don't know, which are your results and your discussion. But everything else should be the same. The method should be the same. Your inclusion criteria should be the same or exclusion criteria. The background is the same. The reasons why you're doing it is the same. And the only thing you have to change is the tense. In your protocol, you write stuff as, we will search these data. We will synthesize this. And then you just change it. You say, we searched this. We did this, right? So again, think about it that way um, because a lot of these things shouldn't change. Um, it's really advisable uh, that you register your protocol Actually, protocols can be published in different journals as well. So it's another piece of scholarship that you could put up there. I mean, that hopefully you're not only driven by, oh, it's another publication, but let's admit that that's important uh, for a lot of our disciplines, right? Um, you can also register your protocol. Uh, and here are some registries in case you don't want to pay, you know, authorship fees. Um, these are actually free. And remember that whatever you indicated in your protocol has to be addressed, right, uh, in your final manuscript. There's many different reasons why we sometimes can deviate uh, or we deviate from the protocol. We need to articulate that, okay? And say, we, you know, we had to do this or this changed, and this is what we did to mitigate bias. Um, and you always have to be ahead of it ahead of that too. Some of the methods like scoping reviews allow a little bit more flexibility when it comes to making changes, but again, poor planning is not one of them, okay? So if I have, haven't hammered this down to a T, let me reinstate it. It is developing your protocol is the most important step of the process. Your protocol is where you and your team really should achieve maximum clarity uh, and don't resist time to, to taking time to develop it. Um, if you and your team don't have clarity about what it exactly is that you're going to be doing as a team, it's really sad what happens down the road because confusion in a team when you're like further ahead in the process uh, can really break your study completely apart, right? Because if there was something that wasn't clear in your plan, there's no way to undo it later. You have to start all over again. Uh, typically, uh, a lot of the issues that I see it stems from this because uh, an unclear and underdeveloped protocol delays everyone at all stages, screening, searching. Uh, it just introduces bias into your review. It decreases chance of being published. Um, you know, think about that too. And it just sort of builds in lack of trust and confidence, not only from your team members, but also from your readers, right? Like put, put yourself in, in, in their shoes, right? Because we're also readers and consumers and critical appraisers of information. Like if, you, if this team doing this couldn't even come up with a detailed plan and follow it through, why should you expect your readers to trust you? So I mentioned this before, eligibility criteria. This is determined uh, during your protocol stage. Basically is what you decide is the set of criteria uh, that you're going to use to determine whether these studies make it in or out of your study. Um, and it has to be uh, 
applied consistently throughout the review. So eligibility criteria can be anything, right? But again, the question you have to keep in mind is, is this criteria getting me closer or actually like, you know, bonafide for me to be able to answer my research question? And so it can be time. It says, well, the topic we're interested in is actually came about in the last 10 years. So time, uh, it could be language, it can be age, it can be uh, a specific type of study or method or tool, whatever it is that you decide, it, it's, it's fine. But you always have to think about, is this criteria getting me closer to the answer that um, I want to do? And sometimes the stage or context or the evidence is the one that dictates. Going back to the COVID example, I mean, ideally doing those rapid reviews, you know, you would like to see research articles, but unfortunately, because there hadn't been enough time to write proper research articles on COVID uh, circa the summer of 2020, you know, and, and I participated in several reviews of that, we had to take a look at other, maybe not as high in the confidence of evidence, you know, or like traditional research articles, uh, but we had to take a look at commentaries and letters to the editor and, uh, you know, case studies, because that's what there was. And so I use it as an example to remind you that sometimes what's available out there uh, may not be necessarily, uh, you know, what ideally you like to introduce in your study. And that's okay, right? Because at the end, the goal in doing one of these things is to report what you find, not what you want to find, we report what we find, right? And sometimes that means the quality of the studies was low, and that's a finding in and of itself. So searching for studies, and this is when you uh, sort of uh, have consultations or talk to uh, your library, uh, your liaison librarians, um, you know, it involves creating a search strategy, or if you're doing it yourself, remember that it, the goal is to be very sensitive, okay? It must be comprehensive. You have to think abstractly and at a higher level, uh, you operational concepts that are fuzzy. Um, you try to search for minimum concepts, you search using keywords and phrases, subject headings, depending if the database, you know, they have control vocabulary and it's applicable. But none of these provide the detailed context and definition necessary to screen for studies. So it's a little bit of a mind switch here because you create a search strategy that you apply to thousands of articles at once. But then the next phase is screening for articles and you screen for articles one at a time. OK, and I talked about this a little bit before. And just to reiterate, the first level of screening really is title and abstract. So say you have this beautiful search. It's been peer reviewed, it's transparent, it's great, you know, and now you're ready to screen. The first round of screening is you actually just re read the title and abstract of each study. That's it. And then you make a decision on whether to include or exclude that article. At this stage, the goal is for you to be over inclusive, right? Because you haven't read the full text. So, you know, you don't have all the information. If the article makes it through, if the study makes it through, you go to second level of screening. And it's also done by independent reviewer pairs. And you take a look at the full text. So now you have all the information, okay? And then you can decide based on your eligibility criteria, whether this is gonna make it to data abstraction or not, okay? The reasons for exclusion must be recorded. Pilot tested is recommended. I give a workshop on screening. If you're interested in that, we can talk about that later. <laughs> data abstraction, uh, is also, so when you have all these articles, you're just like, hey, these are gonna make it into a review. And then again, by independent reviewer pairs, you decide based on predefined, you know, like data or reason, what you're gonna abstract. There's some things that are non-negotiable, right? Because, uh, you know, there's almost like boilerplate uh, things like title, year of publication, country publication, author, you know, all of that. But then what else? What is it that you need to gather from these articles in order for you to paint your story when you synthesize the data, you know? Um, and uh, again, you ideally, this is also based on your eligibility criteria, this in, in that question, what is necessary for me to abstract from these articles in order to answer the research question of this study? And it's also done by independent review reviewers. Critical appraisal, um, this is not necessary for most knowledge synthesis types actually is absolutely necessary and built into the methods for systematic reviews um, and meta-analysis. There's tools that exist in the form of checklists that assess the risk of bias of each study. And basically you're, you can perform it for other KS 
study types like scoping reviews, but it's not written into the methods, but you must absolutely do critical appraisal for systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And there's tools for that too. So synthesis, these vary for study different review methods. Um, how you're going to synthesize or summarize actually your studies is also developed in your protocol um, and the reasons why. Uh, and remember each knowledge synthesis have different purposes, content and structure. Uh, and you know you, you should think about that and again, bring it back to how, what is it the kind, what's the kind of story, what's the story that you want to tell about what it is that you found, right? Reporting guidance. These are also very important to remember each, and I mentioned them before, there's a method for conducting the study, and then there are the guidelines, which are beautiful, they're a checklist on how you're going to report your study, how are you going to report your manuscript. And it's all, again, uh, there are individual guidelines for individual for each study type. So there's a guideline for protocols, there's a guideline for scoping reviews, there's a guideline for systematic reviews, there's a guideline for rapid reviews, okay? There's even a guideline for searching. Okay, so I'm just gonna touch a little bit more into two different study types, which are the usual suspects, which are systematic reviews and scoping reviews, okay? Ideally, when you're conducting a systematic review, you know, you have a pretty specific and well-defined question, okay? Uh, the methods to follow are typically the Cochrane Handbook, JPI has a pretty good methodology, okay? So when to conduct a systematic review, answering specific questions, primarily now used for interventions, the diagnostics, you know, like they're very famous when it comes to drug efficacy, right? Especially because a drug is a drug, either the brand names or, you know, like the chemical formula, the pharmaceutical name. So there's nothing fuzzy about that, right? Um, of course, review, systematic reviews are done outside of uh, health sciences and increasingly so more and more. But the thing to remember is that they tend to be very, very specific. Okay. And um, a key feature uh, is, well, it's true for all of these review types, but a key feature is the reporting has to be very clear, transparent and reproducible. Um, and, and it's one of the most prominent, you know, prominent types of reviews. The strength is that um, typically they involve um, only quantitative studies, but more and more they can involve a mix of study designs. Um, the challenging is that, again, it's the thing that makes them unique, right? Like it's the fact that there can be pretty narrow and very specific. And so think about it like if you have a pretty specific question that you like answer, you know, probably a systematic review would be a, the best methodology for you uh, uh, to approach your study type. Scoping reviews are actually it's almost like, you know, quite the opposite in the sense that this is sort of like the wild west. So uh, things that are fuzzy concepts and when you try to get the lay of the land, this, you know, there hasn't been, uh, you know, your, your topic is a little bit more loose uh, and an open-ended question, not lack of planning again and not lack of focus, uh, but a scoping review perhaps is the best methodology for you. Um, Right, sometimes they're used to examine the extent, range, and nature of the literature out there. Um, sometimes they're done as a precursor to a systematic review. They're often used to uh, find out definitions. You know, uh, these thing has not been well defined, but like we're trying to figure out how it's defined in the literature. You know, um, it's, they're also used to identify gaps um, in the existing body of literature. I mean, that's the case for most knowledge synthesis, but specifically when not a lot is known. Scoping reviews are your best bet. Um, you know, again, they have methods for conduct and their own reporting guideline, which you should follow uh, to the T. The challenges are actually the things that make it a pro for some folks. So, you know, establishing boundaries may be difficult. Um, they lack a quality assessment, so you do not have to do critical appraisal for reviews. And so you can, they tend to include bias and low quality information may be introduced, right? But that's something that, again, uh, the goal for all research really, not only these things, is that you need to be as transparent as possible. And that's okay, right? Because we can't control what's published out there. We really can't. We don't know and we can't control that, right? Nor the quality of what's published. But our goal, our job is always to be transparent and to, you know, just say it like it is, right? Like this is what we found and the quality is high, low or whatever. Um, you know, the strength is that it allows you to have that flexibility and wiggle room. Uh, they allow you to and 
to clarify working definitions or conceptual boundaries of a topic or field. Um, but again, one of the challenges is this, the opposite side of that coin, right? Is that establishing boundaries may be difficult. So narrative reviews or simply literature reviews, um, they're not really, they're not knowledge synthesis. They are not protocol driven. They may or may not involve comprehensive, reproducible, transparently reported searches. Um, they don't necessarily, actually they don't call for a protocol. They don't involve independent uh, or pairs of reviewer or screening. The synthesis is always narrative. There's a high potential for bias and lack of transparency. Uh, what ends up making it into a narrative review or a literature review may be cherry picked. So by the author, they can be completed by one person. Now there's not to say that they don't have value, okay? Because remember, the best research out there is the one that you have all the resources to do to the best of your ability. And by resources, I mean experience in the methods, time, you know, uh, and the ability to finish it, right? to, to do it well. And so don't, none of us should be trying to do things that are out of our bounds, right? So do we have the skill set to complete this? And if the answer is yes, go ahead, right? But if the answer is no, there's no shame uh, in doing, in reaching for another type of methodology uh, to answer the question or to put something out um, into the research and to the scholarship. So <laughs> I have a question for you. Do you think the majority of researchers know the difference among reviews do they know the methods or know what they're doing? Feel free to unmute yourself. Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you if you were guessing no or selling saying no, no. <laughs> uh, sadly, that's the truth. Um, and that's okay. But why is this happening, right? Um, I feel researchers uh, feel compelled to take on work that they're not prepared or ill-equipped to perform because there are certain pressures out there that we cannot deny. You know, there are conflicting systems of rewards and incentives. You know, academics want tenure, um, promotion to generalize and concretize knowledge and fuel new ideas. Publishers want money, university values ranking and undervalued transparency and rigor. Uh, the current tenure and promotion practices value impact factor, the number of publications and grants, but they don't value how transparent the research was, how rigorous the research was, how well the, this faculty or how, how much mentorship occurred, you know? Uh, and faculty struggle to make these ends meet. Um, and so, you know, they want jobs, we want job security. The peer review system is broken. You know, journals are likely to publish garbage and they do just to get money. Um, peer review takes a lot of time and is an unpaid and untrade endeavor. Uh, being an editor is also an unpaid, <laughs> sometimes untrained endeavor as well, right? There's a blind leading the blind effect. Uh, there's a cohort of poorly trained researchers uh, and they go out and train early, Students, all of you are early career researchers, right? And again, because of the peer review system being broken, if you publish something and it's of low quality, of low rigor, but you were like, hey, it was published, that you use that as a self-fulfilling prophecy to keep, even though we didn't learn the methods, you know, folks don't learn the methods, they're like, but I published this. In reality, that means that doesn't really mean anything. And so I'm just curious if you have any other ideas of what. Uh, or what else do you think this happens? Tell you what, I'm gonna keep moving forward with the presentation because if you do have ideas, write them down, keep them to yourself and we can talk about them uh, in the question period. Uh, this is a problem because it creates wasteful research. Uh, there's duplicate research. Um, there's poorly conducted research. Uh, the research is not addressing a gap in knowledge. And so getting a publication should never be the thing that drives you, not the only thing anyway. You know, millions of dollars a year are given out to researchers all over the world. And if you think about, and it comes from us, all of us, taxpayer dollars, if the amount of money that is wasted in poor research, right? Not to mention that it can make an impact in everyone's lives when it comes to policy, uh, healthcare, when it comes to everything really, uh, standards, you know, um, that 
eventually have a detrimental impact to all of us. That's a good uh, series to read. Uh, it's on the lens that it came out about six years ago or so. I'm just a link to it there. And so, you know, when we think about who's responsible, funding agencies, universities, publishers, you know, I'm not sure entirely who, it, who is fully responsible, but I'm certainly sure that the solution is, is not only one of these uh, agencies, right? It's not only one of these entities. We have to be, you know, we all have to pitch in into this. They want to mention that typically knowledge entities have been pretty popular within the health sciences, but they're becoming more and more common and outside the health sciences, so social sciences, humanities, engineering, natural sciences. And this presents a set of different challenges and opportunities. You know, the proliferation of these studies um, in different disciplines means that researchers, librarians, and students haven't necessarily been ex exposed to these methods, right? Journal editors as well and peer reviewers are not prepared necessarily, I'm not saying they're not at all, um, in these methodologies. And so as what I was mentioning before, this can cascade into authors believing their manner of conducting these studies is fit for publication. You know, over time capacity starting to grow and so are training opportunities, but the challenge remains that sometimes training is also taught by individuals who are not expert. The other thing is that the topics tend to be more complex um, and often the resources or sources of information, because let's not forget that these are actually information uh, projects, right? Are not necessarily tailored to perform and report aspects in a transparent way, specifically when it comes to searching. But there's also opportunities. There's an opportunity to collaborate among all of us, uh, to develop courses and training, to do exactly what you invited me here to do. This is wonderful. This is actually that's part of my job, you know, peer mentorship collaboration. And I love my job, by the way. Uh, we can partner with each other, right? Research is becoming increasingly multidisciplinary. So there's always a chance to harness the knowledge of both researchers, librarians, students, and faculty who have expertise from all disciplines. I do want to talk briefly, and I wanted to mention this because this brings me to another piece that is rarely discussed, I find, and it's really important, and that means authorship. Uh, you know, like, who is an author? What constitutes authorship, you know? And why does authorship matter? Uh, now, I've just uh, chosen the ICMGJE, I always get that acronym wrong, um, criteria on what authorship means. That's fine, just go to whatever, um, body that you are you know that you feel comfortable sort of like taking note or page from what constitutes authorship for you particularly if you if any of you have published and when you submit an article you, these are not or these are and okay you have to uh indicate and sign uh that you have made substantial contributions to the conception or design requisition, analysis, interpretation, and data of the work, and drafting the work, revising it critically for important intellectual content, and uh, approve the final version to be published, and agree to be accountable for all aspects of the work, ensuring that the questions related to the accuracy or integrity are appropriately investigated and resolved. And so I think that's important that we don't often think about authorship, right? We think, or what does that really mean? We think it's a right, it's really a privilege, um, because that means that it's really, you're, you're taking responsibility for this thing that you're going to put out there into the world to your peers and everyone else who happens to read it. And so I think we, we need to, not only for knowledge synthesis, of course, but whenever we, we put something up, we need to be, we, you know, I think we need to be a little bit more reflective um, of what being an author means and what that constitutes. And I'll leave you with this question again. Um, if you've ever reading, read, seen, or given any thought to what defines authorship before, and we can talk about it in a few minutes. Uh, I really like the four Gs of authorship. Remember in authorship, uh, there should be no ghosts, no guessing, no gifts, and no guests, okay? Um, wow, I'm done even with a little bit extra time. <laughs> um, so I will leave you with this quote, which is from, a really a real hero of mine uh, and mentor. Uh, he passed away about three years ago. His name was Doug Altman and he was a medical statistician at the University of Oxford. Um, and he said, you know, readers should not have to infer it was probably done in any research, in any article really, or any scholarship, they should be told explicitly. And I think I, I, I encourage you to think as readers, 
and to think in, in researchers yourselves or future researchers to really take this to heart, to never leave your reader uh, inferring anything. You know, like I always say, you know, like, um, I mean, if this is your business, that's great. Um, but this is not an Nancy Drew novel, you know, like <laughs> there's no, there should be no mystery in the scholarship that we be, that we put out. It should be pretty clear. Um, and as readers, you know, we shouldn't ever be questioning, like, I wonder what, what they mean. I wonder what was done. Um, so the goal of it is to always be clear and transparent and to think about uh, what it is that we're putting out there and to also think about what it is that you're reading and putting out there um, into the world of scholarship. So uh, I will open it up for questions, but before that, I wanted to thank you. Thank you very much for your time and attention uh, and your invitation. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And by the way, I'm gonna share these slides with everyone. Um, and the session is being recorded. So please, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them.